Good morning. How is everyone? Congratulations and welcome to 2023. You are the ones who have made it out of bed. You're the ones who are not on holidays. But what I want to encourage us to do over the holidays and what we want to do in our sermon series throughout these holidays uh, is to encourage us not just to take a break and relax and forget everything, but to continue to meet with Jesus. Like uh, as we have seen with Nicodemus, to continue to create space and time, not just to be refreshed physically and emotionally and recharged, but to be recharged spiritually, to connect with God in the midst of our everyday, to encounter Jesus as we go about our holidays. And that's what we want to encourage with the stories that we'll share over the summer months. But for now, welcome. Uh, Congratulations on making it first thing in the morning on New Year's morning. It can be a challenge, can't it, to make it anywhere on New Year's, uh, let alone to make it to church at 10 o'clock. But as I was thinking about New Year's, <coughs> I was thinking about some of the, the traditions that we have, the traditions that different people have at New Year's. Uh, personally, I enjoyed the, the 9.30 fireworks down at the park, to welcome, and I welcomed in the New Year fast asleep on the couch before I managed to crawl into bed a little after midnight. But I've discovered a number of different traditions in different countries uh, when it comes to New Year's. In some places, it's about eating the right kind of food. If you eat the right kind of food, it brings you good luck. In some countries like Spain, it's grapes. You eat 12 grapes, and that will set you up for the year. Uh, In the Netherlands, it spoke about cakes. Eating cakes is a way to start the new year. Or in in places like Austria, the food of progress uh, and good beginnings is pork. So you need some pork on your fork, as they say in Australia. But it's not just about the right food. There are different traditions in some places, or for some people, it's about hanging onions. You hang some onions on the doorstep or on the the arch of your your home. For others, it's about stealing a kiss at the stroke of midnight. For others, and and some of you might have seen this, at midnight it's lighting the fireworks. Or throwing out water out your window is one tradition as a symbolic gesture to get rid of any bad spirits in your house. Uh, But in Latin America, it's making sure you have your... Uh, your lucky undies on. That's the way to start the new year. I'm not sure if anyone has any lucky undies this morning. There are some pretty obscure traditions, but in most countries, for most people, New Year's Eve is about getting together with people, about spending time with people. For some, it's going into the city and, and surrounding ourselves with this massive crowd of strangers. But more often than not, it's with family and friends and loved ones at someone's house or in a park. But the interesting thing I find about New Year's uh, and New Year's Eve is it's one of the only times when you're allowed and expected to stay at your friend's house beyond midnight. You know, most times it's like we need to get out, 10 o'clock we should get out and we should go home and should let you get to bed, but not New Year's Eve. We are almost required to stay at someone's house until midnight so we can begin the new year with commitments and resolutions that are usually gone by morning or we break within the first couple of weeks. And that's what struck me about today's passage and the scene you saw how dark it was. Uh, it was actually quite hard to see. But Jesus has this visitor This very important visitor in the middle of the night, this man called Nicodemus, who has all these questions, all these questions that lead to this interesting conversation with Jesus that ends up with an invitation to a new beginning, a new beginning, a new understanding, a new relationship with Jesus. When it comes to Nicodemus, we get this little introduction, don't we? John says that Nicodemus was a Pharisee, is a member of the Jewish ruling council. And if you're not sure what that means, as a, a, a Pharisee, or a, the, the Jewish council was usually known as the Sanhedrin. And so this means that Nicodemus is a leader. He is a leader in Jewish society. He is a rule follower. He is used to following the law. And he is one of the religious elite among the people of God. He is someone who for his whole life has demanded adherence to God's law. He has studied and demanded adherence even more so sometimes than obedience to God. 
Father, we often see the Pharisees, don't we, as self-righteous and judgmental because that they believe deep down. Uh, and many of the Pharisees believed that if the nation of Israel could keep the commands of God, all 613 for just 24 hours, it would pave the way for the Messiah to come. For God to come and rescue his people. Think about it. We can't manage to keep track of our New Year's commitments, maybe 12 hours or 24 hours or at least a few weeks. And yet they were expecting the whole nation of Israel to keep all 613 laws for 24 hours straight. I can't help but wonder if Nicodemus has realized the futility of religion. His faith that the Jewish people might fulfill this commitment, this obligation uh, to follow through and, and keep the laws for 24 hours. But more so as you read, it seems he has seen something beautiful, something profound and powerful in Jesus that exceeded anything the law had been able to offer him. And so Nicodemus comes. All these questions running through his mind, but fearing the uh, reproach of the rest of his companions on the Sanhedrin, he comes in the middle of the night. He comes under the cover of darkness. And I have to admit, as I read this, I see a little of myself and many of us in Nicodemus. Don't get me wrong, we don't necessarily wait till midnight to come to Jesus. But many of us, like Nicodemus, have spent our lives, haven't we, following the rules following the rules in order to create this perfect Christian facade. To the point where we're afraid sometimes to ask the questions that are burning deep within us, to admit our weakness, to let our guard down and come to Jesus because we're concerned. We're concerned about the impressions of others. What will others think if we admit our weakness? We acknowledge we don't have it all together. I'm sure most of us have had those moments in our lives. Maybe there was a stirring in our heart, an invitation to receive prayer, and we hesitate because we're worried what people will think if we respond. Maybe we've had an invitation to join a small group, to go deeper in a relationship, to, to, to engage with a, a level of personal and, and spiritual accountability. We've shied away because we're afraid to open up and to share our struggles, to let others see us for who we are. Maybe it was in terms of our witness. Most of us have journeyed with people, some uh, for a short time, some our whole lives. And as much as they have opened up and shared their struggles, we find it really hard to admit our weakness, our failings, our shortcomings. And to share about the hope and the strength that we have found in Jesus. You know, as much as the church has been in decline for many years, the reality is that much like Nicodemus, people are searching. People in our society are interested in searching for spiritual truth. They are, have endless questions about faith and about Jesus. But they're not turning to the church as an institution. They're looking for authentic Christians. Authentic Christians who can be real about our struggles we face throughout life, about how our faith gives us strength and hope and comfort in those moments when the world seems out of control. That is the kind of faith that our world is searching for. That is the kind of faith that people need to see. Authentic followers of Jesus. And you know where it starts? When we let go of this photoshopped facade. When we move beyond mere adherence to the law, we fully embrace his invitation of Jesus to be born again. He's born of the Spirit. I want us to notice where this conversation starts. It starts with this question from Nicodemus, doesn't it? This admission that all his religious endeavors were powerless to bring about any significant or lasting change. Do you notice verse 2, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are our teacher who has come from God. But no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Nicodemus has recognized this incredible distinction and, and distance between his religious patterns and the power of Jesus to bring about true and lasting transformation. 
And he has come to the conclusion that it is God. It is God's presence and power with Jesus that makes what he has done possible. And while he's right, at least in one sense, it's certainly not something he would own up to the rest of the the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, as you saw in the video, for, for the sake of ridicule. And yet Jesus doesn't leave him at that place, believing it is something to do with God. He takes him a step deeper. He said it's not about the power of God on a person, but about the Spirit of God in a person. That's what makes the difference between religion and an authentic Christian. That's what it takes to, to, to minister and to share our faith as people of God's kingdom. And it's important to remember here, as much as we're used to this language of new birth, we've read it many times, haven't we? We've seen John 3 and we know these metaphors within the Bible. For, for Nicodemus, this wasn't normal. This wasn't normal conversation and so as as much as he asked this question about going back into his mother's womb, this is a legitimate question that he has. But for us, we know Jesus is being metaphorical. So all you mums in the room can breathe a huge sigh of relief. It's not about going through childbirth again, this time fully grown. But as I thought about this, I, I wonder if this same point this same part of this passage makes us a little uncomfortable not so much practically but spiritually now for most of us we're okay with the idea of being born again aren't we this is familiar we understand it we're okay with the idea of the spirit dwelling in us we're okay when it comes to the spirit working in and for us at least until it gets a little uncomfortable And the Spirit starts to move that that in ways are unfamiliar. That take us outside our comfort zone. And yet that's exactly what Jesus is talking about with Nicodemus. According to Jesus, the Spirit cannot be reduced to human actions or obedience or adherence to God's law as Nicodemus had imagined. The Spirit comes and goes, he says, wherever he pleases, like the wind. And so it's not up to us to lead. It's up to us to listen to the Spirit. The Spirit is the one who stirs in our hearts a passion. The Spirit is the one who creates a desire to live, not according to rules and regulations, but according to the patterns of God's kingdom. And it's only those who have been born again who can follow the Spirit where he leads. As those who have been born of the Spirit, we have the very life, the the breath of God in our hearts. Not only so we can see what he is doing and hear what he is saying, but so we can discern his leading and follow wherever he takes us. That's what it means, isn't it? The Bible talks about live by the Spirit. What does it mean to live by the Spirit? To live according to the Spirit. Uh, According to, to live by the Spirit means going beyond going beyond adherence to the law, going on be reading and understanding God's word. It's about having our hearts transformed. Our hearts transformed by the spirit of God so we can pursue a lifestyle of obedience. A life that is shaped by the presence and the empowering of God's spirit. It's how Jesus lived, isn't it? That's how Jesus lived. He, he followed the wind and the ways of the Spirit. That's how he taught with such great authority. That's how he healed and cast out demons. That's how he forgave the sins and calmed the raging seas. And that's what caught the attention of Nicodemus. And that's what causes him to come in the middle of the night and to search out answers to his questions. Questions about who is this Jesus? And why does he have such power and authority? And where does Jesus point Nicodemus? Not to himself. Not to the the law. But to his perfect sacrifice. Most fully displayed on the cross. In the same way Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert for the salvation of many. 
John summarizes this. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. In fact, it goes on to explain that, that Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He didn't come to change our outward behaviors and patterns. He came so that whoever believes would receive life. And in receiving life, that he could change our hearts. That could help us from being drawn into the darkness and the, the patterns of sin that are so prevalent in this world. So we could live under the presence and power of the Spirit. To live in obedience to God. That's where Jesus leads Nicodemus. And that is the invitation that Jesus offers each of us today. An invitation to move beyond mere religious adherence where the outside looks good but the inside, in the inside there is darkness. And into a life that is transformed and empowered by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And some of you are probably wondering where this story ends. It's one of those cliffhanger stories, isn't it? It sort of ends in the middle of nowhere. Um, we don't know how Nicodemus responded. We don't know how he responds to Jesus. And yet, as you look further on in the, the book of John, you see that after Jesus' death, in preparation for his burial, these two unlikely characters come and claim the body. The first is Joseph of Arimathea, who owns a tomb, and he comes and requests Pilate's permission to prepare Jesus' body for burial. But this second character, this second name that is mentioned is Nicodemus. Nicodemus, who comes and helps repair Jesus' body. Who comes and lays his body in the tomb. And so it seems to me that this midnight encounter with Jesus had changed something in Nicodemus. It had changed everything for Nicodemus. It had brought him into a relationship, a faith relationship with Jesus, where he experienced new birth, was given a new spirit, was introduced to a new pattern of life and love, where more than just adherence to the law... He was willing to step outside his comfort zone to pursue a pattern of un, an absolute obedience to the Spirit. Even though it might cost him everything. Think about it. If you were one of the Jewish leaders who had just put Jesus to death, and now Nicodemus is in public collecting Jesus' body and preparing him for burial, this could be costly for Nicodemus. It could cost him his title as a Pharisee. It could cost him his place on the Sanhedrin. It could cost him everything. But something has changed. Something has changed for Nicodemus. Something has changed in Nicodemus. And more than following the rules, you would follow the leading of God's Spirit. No, we've missed the cover of darkness. Midnight was a long time ago now. But I want to invite us to respond this morning. To respond to, to God's spirit. To respond with faith. To respond with the kind of commitment we see in Nicodemus. A commitment to stop going through the motions. To stop worrying about what others will think. And commit to making a new beginning. A new beginning in our relationship with Jesus. A new beginning where we commit to living in his presence and with his power. So we can follow him into everything he has for us in 2023. This story of Nicodemus, it's an incredible story, isn't it? And the invitation is alive and well for us today. To move beyond a faith that is just about what we do. And to walk and to live in obedience to the Spirit of God. Who's working in us and through us to achieve His purpose in a fallen, broken world. I trust that we would be willing this morning to open ourselves afresh. Invite the Spirit to fill us, flow through us. That we might be willing to go to places that are uncomfortable, places that are difficult, places that often seem dark. 
and bring the light and the love of Jesus into the world around us. I wonder as the worship team come, if you would stand with me and invite you to respond just momentarily in your heart. Just take a moment before God. And then I'd love to pray for us. And then there'll be a short video, I think. <laughs> Apologies for getting the worship team up early. But just take a moment before God. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful and so mindful as we come to this day of new beginnings, the new beginning you have offered us in Jesus. God, more than following the rules and more than living in our own strength, you invite us to be born again, to be born of your spirit. We know that you have given us your spirit not just to to help us as another counsellor, to dwell within us as our peace as our joy as our hope as our strength as we engage with whatever this world throws at us God we pray this morning that you would stir in our hearts that you would fill us afresh that you would give us a a renewed sense of the, the beauty and the wonder not only of Jesus but the gift that he has given in your spirit. And may that move us to live. To live with his wisdom, his strength, his enabling in every situation. In all this year brings that the love and the light of Jesus might shine through us. And we ask it in his